ان الحمد لله نحمده ونستعينه ونستغفره ونعوذ بالله من شرور انفسنا ومن سيئات اعمالنا من يهده الله فلا مضل له ومن يضلله فلا هادي له واشهد ان لا اله الا الله وحده لا شريك له واشهد ان محمدا عبده ورسوله صلى الله عليه وعلى اله وصحبه وسلم أما بعد فإن خير الكلام كلام الله وخير الهدي هدي محمد صلى الله عليه وسلم وشر الأمور محدثاتها وكل محدثة بدعة وكل بدعة ضلالة وكل ضلالة في النار We begin by praising Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala We praise him, we seek his aid and assistance and we beg his forgiveness we seek refuge with Allah from the evils of our own selves and the consequences of our sins. Whomever Allah guides aright, one can misguide. And whomever Allah leads astray, one can guide aright. I testify that none of those worship but Allah alone without partner. And I testify that Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is Allah's final messenger and his most sincere and devout worshipper. The best speech is the speech of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And the best guidance is the guidance of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And the worst of all things are those that are newly introduced, invented into the religion. And everything newly introduced into the religion is a bid'ah, an innovation. And every religious innovation is misguidance, and misguidance leads only to the fire. Uh, so we continue tonight going through uh, some topics primarily concerning our Muslim sisters and in the previous couple of uh, classes we've been talking about the masjid, the mosque and uh, some general points about the mosque uh, and more specifically about uh, women, Muslim women going to the mosque and we continue with some of the ahadith some of the narrations from the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam that concern women going to the mosques. And we're going to, inshallah ta'ala, finish off reading some of those today and then move on um, in the remaining time to talk about some of the adab, some of the etiquette of the mosque in general, uh, which is relevant to both brothers and sisters, anyone who attends the mosque. So continuing the ahadith about women going out to the mosque, we have the narration here that we mentioned in the last lesson that the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam wished that he would make, or he expressed the wish to make a separate entrance, a separate door for the women, and then. The next narration mentions here, reported by Aisha radiallahu ta'ala anha, who said, In kana Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, la yusalli as subh, fayansarifu al nisa, mutalafi'at, bimurutu hinna, ma yu'rafna min al ghalas. This hadith. Is in Sahih al Bukhari. In this hadith, Aisha radiallahu ta'ala anha said, Allah's Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam would pray the dawn prayer and fajr at subh. And the women would, uh, after finishing the prayer, they would get up and leave. Mutalaffi'at, which means basically wrapped up in their murut. In their murut. Murut is a kind of cloak, a large cloak that covers the whole body. And I should continue saying, مَا يُعْرَفْنَ مِنَ الْغَلَسِ And they could not be recognized in the darkness of the dawn or this period of darkness at, uh, at the time of dawn. So in this hadith, Aisha radiallahu ta'ala anha describes a number of things about 
the attendance of women during that time uh, to, uh, at the mosque. That they used to attend the dawn prayer is one of the things that we learn from this hadith. And that when the Prophet ﷺ had finished praying, we learned that the women used to turn away. They used to finish, when they had finished the prayer, they would get up and go. And when they left the mosque, they would be what is described in this narration, mutalaffi'at. And this talaffi'at in Arabic is when a person covers their whole body in the garment or in the cloth that they are wearing. And some of the scholars have mentioned that a talaffi'at means when a person covers their whole body and it necessarily includes covering the head. So this word, which is used by Aisha radiallahu ta'ala anha in this hadith, describes how the women would leave the mosque after the Fajr prayer, mutalaffi'at, totally wrapped in their uh, outer garments, such that their heads, they would be covered from head to toe. And the garment which is mentioned here, which was used as the jilbab or used as the outer garment, is the murut. Uh, and these are the ty- these are a particular type of uh, big kind of cloaks, um, which fulfill the purpose of covering the women in their entirety. And the end of the hadith, Aisha radiallahu anha mentioned, "Ma yu'afna min al They would not be recognized, or they could not be recognized, because or in the time of darkness. And this indicates, some scholars have mentioned, that either they were uh, covered so completely and so thoroughly that the women could not be recognized one from another. And uh, some other scholars have mentioned that it could also be due to the darkness of the hour, the time. And it could be a combination of both, that the women were so well covered when they left the mosque and it was still, they used to leave quickly, uh, and we will see in some narrations later on when we talk about women actually praying in the mosque, that one of the sunan, one of the practices that Muslim women should practice is that they should leave the mosque quickly after the salah. They would leave immediately after the salah if there was nothing else uh, in the masjid, there no lessons or no nothing else to do, that they would leave quickly. And this is indicated in this narration as well. Uh, as they would leave during the darkness and they would be fully covered such they would not be able to be recognized and this indicates the hijab, the covering and the modesty that they used to have. And then we have finally uh, in this section we have another narration from Aisha radiallahu ta'ala anha uh, an important statement from Aisha radiallahu ta'ala anha which is also reported uh, in Al-Bukhari and also in Sahih Muslim, uh, she said, "Rabbillah anha, لو أدرك رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم ما أحدث النساء لمنعهن كما منعت نساء بني إسرائيل." In this narration, <coughs> Aisha states, "If Allah's Messenger صلى الله عليه وسلم were to see what the women have done now." He would have prevented them from going to the masjid in the same way that the women of Bani Israel, the women of the children of Israel, were prevented or prohibited from going to their mosques or places of worship. And this hadith, has, uh, there are a number of points of benefit, a number of things that we can uh, benefit from considering what the scholars have said about this narration. First thing to point out is that some scholars and some people in the past argued on the basis of this narration that women should not go to the mosque because this was this in, this narration indicates or it has been interpreted to indicate that it is not good for the women to go to the mosque because of the way that the women have began to behave uh, with regards to the way they dress and their behavior has become inappropriate. And this is why Aisha radiallahu ta'ala anha said that if the Prophet knew, 
if the Prophet saw what the women have done, what they had introduced, then he would have prevented them from going to the mosque. Uh, and the scholars have explained that this is not actually the intent uh, of Aisha radiallahu ta'ala anha, and it's not really, strictly speaking, the meaning of this narration. Rather, in this narration, Aisha radiallahu ta'ala anha expressed her view and her position that if the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam had, had seen what the women had done, meaning what, and what this means, as ulama have explained, it includes uh, women becoming complacent when it, when, with regards to the way they dress, such that may, maybe some women had begun to wear perfume when going out, or they had started to wear nice clothes when going out to the masjid, uh, and beautifying themselves, wearing, uh, you know, things that may attract attention towards them, uh, that this is what is meant by the women, what they had done or what they had began to do. And this refers to, of course, some women having uh, done this, that some women had started to do this, and so Aisha radiallahu ta'ala anha expressed her disapproval and expressed that this is something which was not good that some women had begun to do after the time of the Prophet ﷺ. And so she expressed that if this was the case with those kind of women, then those women should be prevented and the Prophet ﷺ would have prevented those women from going to the mosque. So there are a couple of things that we learn from this. Ibn Taymiyyah rahimahullah ta'ala explains the intent of Aisha radiallahu ta'ala anha in this narration when discussing this point. He said that Aisha radiallahu ta'ala anha meant that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, if he had seen how some women have begun to go out to the mosque, in the, st- uh, the state that some women have begun to go out in the mosque, to the mosque, then he would have prevented them and he would have prohibited them from leaving and going out. And she intended, when she said this, that the other hadith from the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam that states, "La tamnu ima Allah masajid Allah," where the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam told us, he told the men, "Do not prevent, do not stop the female worshippers of Allah from going to the uh, mosques of Allah." She meant to say that this is a general ruling a general command from the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam and it is qualified it is qualified and refers to those situations where there is no fasad where there is no evil or corruption being caused by those women and so the best interpretation the best understanding is that for those women who go out to the mosque in a way which is not befitting of a Muslim woman, either in the way that she dresses or because she's wearing perfume and she's not um, correcting her behavior and not correcting the way she dresses and the way she looks when she goes out to the mosque. And those kind of women can be prevented. They can be prevented from going to the mosque and they cannot use as an excuse the fact that the Prophet ﷺ told us not to prevent the worshippers of Allah, the female worshippers of Allah from going to the mosque. And the other thing that we learn from this hadith or this narration uh, was pointed out by Sheikh Abd Aziz ibn Baz, rahmatullahi alayhi, a very beautiful point that we learn from this narration how righteous and how good the women of the Sahaba at the time of the Sahaba, the female companions of the Prophet, وسلم, how pure and how um, correct they were in their actions because this change which was realized or which was noticed and commented on by Aisha radiallahu ta'ala anha indicates that before that time, meaning in the time of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, women, it was their habit, it was their way that they would have full correct hijab and they would go out in the best uh, conditions, in the best uh, dress that was appropriate for a Muslim woman to cover herself properly with 
their behavior was good. And as Sheikh Abdul Aziz Ibn Baz rahimahullah ta'ala mentioned, and they were the best, that, that generation of the Sahaba, they were the best in their behavior, in their actions, uh, in their righteousness, and they are the examples to be followed for, uh, for generations and people who come after them. So these are a couple of points that we understand from that narration. That brings to a close the section that I wanted to cover on uh, some of the regulations and etiquettes of women going out to the mosque. I want to move on now to mention some narrations about the adab, about the etiquettes of the masjid when a person is in the masjid and a person is entering the masjid and staying in the mosque for prayers or for the remembrance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And these etiquettes that we're going to mention are general. They apply, uh, most if not all of them, apply to both men and women. Of course, men are the people who are in the mosques the most and they frequent the mosques most. Uh, and so we need to pay attention to the etiquette, the correct etiquette and manners and behavior uh, in the mosque. As we mentioned at the beginning of uh, this discussion on the mosques, that the mosques are the buyut, are the houses of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has taught us to respect them and to use them for their correct purpose. And since they are the houses made for the worship of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, they have a certain status within the community and they should be respected, and they should be treated and looked after accordingly. So I'm going to list some of those etiquettes which are mentioned in the ahadith, pointing out that we're only mentioning one or two narrations for a particular aspect, and there are many more narrations and many more ahadith regarding perhaps each one of these uh, etiquettes or manners, but we're just going to, because of time, mention one or two narrations about each one. So the first thing, the etiquette of attending the mosque, is we should have al-waqar wa-sakina when we go towards the prayer. That a person should be calm and a person should be uh, not be kind of hurried or hasty and running when a person is going to join the prayer. And this was commanded by the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam in a hadith uh, where he said in the hadith is sahih in sahih muslim and others he said إِذَا أُقِيمَتِ الصَّلَاةِ فَلَا تَأْتُوهَا تَسْعُونَ وَأْتُوهَا تَمْشُونَ وَعَلَيْكُمُ السَّكِينَةِ فَمَا أَدْرَكْتُمْ فَصَلُّوا وَمَا فَاتَكُمْ فَأَتِمُّوا He said, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, when the iqama, when the call for prayer is sounded, that the prayer is beginning, then you should come to the masjid, you should come to the salah, and do not come running, or do not come hastily. Rather, you should come walking. And you must be calm and composed, and peaceful and tranquil when you come to the mosque. And whatever amount of the prayer you catch, then pray it. And whatever you miss, then make it up, complete it when the prayer is finished. So here the Prophet ﷺ told us how to behave when we come to the mosque. Some people uh, mistakenly, erroneously try to catch the prayer. If the prayer has started or the iqama has just gone, and they're outside the mosque, they're walking towards the mosque, uh, they think that to catch the prayer is a good thing as early as possible. So in trying not to miss any part of the prayer, they run sometimes, they hurry. Uh, and this goes against the guidance of the Prophet ﷺ. It goes against the state of mind and the state of body that a person should be in when he arrives at the prayer. He should be calm, ready to remember Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, ready to humble himself in front of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So it's actually more important to arrive at the masjid and arrive at the mosque and arrive to join the prayer in a state of calmness than to actually catch a couple of minutes or a, couple, a few seconds of prayer that you may miss otherwise. The Prophet ﷺ told us, 
you pray whatever you catch and whatever you miss of the prayer, then you make it up. And that is what we've been taught to do in Islam. And we haven't been taught to hurry and run and, 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 you know, and be, uh, not be calm and composed when we arrive to pray. So that's the first thing, to be composed and calm when you come to join the prayer and not to run. The second etiquette that I want to mention here is to make the dua for entering and leaving the mosque. The dua that we have been taught in the sunnah of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. The dua that we have been taught in the authentic sunnah of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. We should say that when we arrive at the masjid and also there's a dua for leaving the masjid. One example of the supplications that we can say and we should say when we come to the mosque and when we leave the mosque is in the following hadith uh, which is also in Sahih Muslim. The Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said إِذَا دَخَلَ أَحَدُكُمُ الْمَسْجِدْ فَلْيَقُلْ اللَّهُمَّ افْتَحْ لِي أَبْوَابَ رَحْمَتِكْ وَإِذَا خَرَجَ فَلْيَقُلْ Allahumma inni as'aluka min fadlik. So the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, when any of you comes to the mosque, when any of you enters the masjid, then he should say, Allahumma iftah li abwaab rahmatik. Which means, O oh Allah, open for me the doors of your mercy. And the Prophet ﷺ said, and when you leave the mosque, then you should say, Allahumma inni as'aluka min fadlik. O oh Allah, I ask you for your blessings and favor and your grace. Some of the ula- ulama have mentioned the kind of a subtle relevance and a wisdom behind asking for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's mercy when entering the mosque and asking for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's fadl, his grace and his uh, blessings and his provision when you leave the mosque and that is when a person enters the mosque he's going towards the forgiveness of sins and going towards the things which are rahma, which are mercy in the hereafter the good deeds that a person does in the mosque so it's appropriate that you ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for his mercy when you enter the mosque and when leaving the mosque we have been told that after the prayers we can go out and because people when they leave the prayers they go out and they seek Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's bounty by going back to work going back to their business, going back to their chores and their errands. So it's appropriate that when we leave the masjid, that we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for his fadl, his grace, since as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said in the Quran about Salatul Jum'ah, in Suratul Jum'ah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us, and when the salah is over, when the prayer is over, they go out in the land and seek Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's fadl, seek Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's grace and his blessings and his provision. So this is appropriate that we ask for these two di- things when coming into the mosque and when leaving the mosque. That's one dua that we have been taught in the authentic sunnah for entering and leaving the mosque. There are others that we say alongside that. As Imam al nawawi said, there are many ahadith, there are many different types of dua which are mentioned in the sunnah of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And some of those narrations can be found in the sunnah of Abu, Abu Dawood and others. And we can refer back to the authentic collections of dhikr, authentic books on dua, supplication and dhikr, remembering Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and refer back to learn those duas and, and practice saying them. The next uh, etiquette or thing that we should uh, try to practice about being at the mosque is tahiyatul masjid, the greeting of the mosque, the two raka prayer, two unit prayer that a person says, uh, when he enters the mosque before sitting down, before sitting down, this is based on the hadith in Sahih al Bukhari reported by Abu Qatada radiallahu ta'ala anhu. He said that Allah's Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, إِذَا دَخَلَ أَحَدُكُمُ الْمَسْجِدْ فَلْيَرْكَعْ رَكْعَتَيْنِ قَبْلَ أَنْ يَجْلِسْ Allah's Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, uh, when any of you enters the mosque, then let him pray. He should pray two units of prayer before he sits down. And in another narration in Bukhari, 
uh, the Prophet ﷺ said, do not sit before you have prayed to raka'ah, before you have prayed two units of prayer. And this is very emphasized uh, to such a degree that the Prophet ﷺ even told a person to pray those prayers while he was making the khutbah once, the sermon on Friday, on the Jum'ah. A man entered and wanted to sit down and sat down before praying the two raka'ah, the two units of the greeting of the mosque and so the Prophet ﷺ actually you know he stopped or he paused his khutbah the man had already sat down but the Prophet ﷺ told him to stand up and pray to raka'ah so it shows that it's very important and it should not be left uh, under any circumstance there is a difference of opinion among scholars as to whether we should pray the tahiyatul masjid during those times of that are forbidden for us to pray. There are certain times of the day where it is forbidden to pray. So if a person enters the mosque during that time, should he pray the Tahiyatul Masjid? The correct position, inshallah ta'ala, is that yes, he should pray that uh, those two raka'ah, no matter what the time is, because those prayers that we have been forbidden from are general but there is a specific reason to pray that we have been commanded to pray these two rak'ahs. So the scholars say that prayers that have a specific reason, like the prayer for entering the mosque, has a specific reason, that is, the entrance or entering the mosque. Such prayers should be prayed at any time. The next etiquette that I want to mention, or the next thing that we need to mention here, is that we should maintain the mosque and keep it clean and keep it pleasant for those who come to worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. There are many texts we already mentioned in the Qur'an that the Qur'an indicates how the mosques should be respected and how they should be maintained. Specifically, we have the hadith of Aisha radiallahu ta'ala anha in the Sunan of Abu Dawood, and it's a Sahih Hadith, she said, أَمَرَ رَسُولُ اللَّهِ صَلَّى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ وَسَلَّمْ بِبِنَاءِ الْمَسَاجِدِ فِي الدُّورِ وَأَن تُنَظَّفَ وَتُطَيَّبْ Aisha رضي الله تعالى عنها reports that Allah's Messenger صلى الله عليه وسلم commanded that the mosques should be built in the neighborhoods, in the areas, and that they should be kept clean, and that they should be perfumed. So we learn from this hadith that the Prophet ﷺ has encouraged us to build mosques as much as we can in different areas, so that different local communities and boroughs and regions can have mosques where they can easily access them. We learn also from this hadith that the mosques should be cleaned, they should be kept clean, and we learn also that they should be perfumed so that they have a pleasant smell uh, inside them. And this, these are all righteous deeds. These are righteous acts that a person is rewarded for uh, by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala if he has a good intention in doing these things. And nobody should feel that doing their part to keep the mosque clean by picking up anything that has fallen on the floor or by keeping the place clean or by wiping the, 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 the you know, areas of the mosque and so on and so forth. Nobody should think that this is in some way, uh, you know, lowers a person's status. Rather, being a cleaner for the mosque is a high status and is a respectable thing and involves much reward. We recall in this regard that there used to be a woman during the time of the Prophet ﷺ who used to clean and maintain the mosque. And one day the Prophet ﷺ didn't see, he didn't find her, he missed her, and he asked about her, and the companions informed him that she had died, that she had passed away. And so the Prophet ﷺ was upset that they had not told him. And so he went to her, he went to her grave, and he prayed the janazah for her, uh, teaching us that a person can have janazah prayed over them afterwards if a person has passed away and nobody has prayed janazah for them. So this woman, some narrations mention that she was a black woman. Some narrations mention that it was a man. But the Prophet, the point is that the Prophet ﷺ asked about this person. 
showing how close the Prophet ﷺ was to the Muslims, that he would ask even about those people who may not be in the highest positions in society, they may have been the cleaners, they may have been people who uh, perhaps were not well known within the society, they were not famous companions. But the Prophet ﷺ used to respect and he used to be close to his community and he used to ask, even being the leader of the community, being the Imam, being the ruler of the Muslims, he would ask about individuals so much so that he even would ask about the person who used to clean the mosque. And this hadith shows us, the scholars have mentioned, the fadila, the virtue and the superiority of being a person who looks after the mosque. That the Prophet ﷺ saw that person as an important person and a person to be respected and a person that he missed if that person was not around. So we should keep the mosques clean and we should keep them perfumed and we should keep them looking and smelling nice such that a person can worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uninhibited and, and, and undistracted uh, in a good environment. And that leads on to the next point, which is the next etiquette we mention here, and that is keeping the mosques free of bad smells. Keeping the mosque free of bad smells, unpleasant smells. Uh, and if a person has eaten something and therefore has an unpleasant strong smell upon him that that person actually has been told to stay away from the mosque until he can get rid of that smell evidence for this is the hadith which is also rep uh, reported in Sahih Muslim and other collections of hadith Allah's messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said man akal al-basal wa wal karat فَلَا يَقْرَبَنَّ مَسْجِدَنَا فَإِنَّ الْمَلَائِكَةَ تَتَأَذَّى مِمَّا يَتَأَذَّى مِنْهُ بَنُوْ آدم. The Prophet ﷺ said, Whoever has eaten onions or garlic should not come close to our mosque. For indeed the malaika, the, the angels, are annoyed or are harmed by what harms the Banu Adam humans. Meaning this smell the smell of onions and garlic and such strong smells should be things that the mosque is free of. And so, the ulama have mentioned, and there are many different narrations about this topic, and the narrations mention that a person should not come to the mosque until he can clean himself and do away with these smells. And this is because two sets of people can be annoyed or can be put to some kind of difficulty through this and that is the angels and also your fellow worshippers in the mosque uh, can be distracted and put off by bad smells and this becomes all the mo more worse when people come to the mosque smelling of cigarettes because of that because they have been smoking close to the mosque or just before coming to the mosque this is also included, the ulama have mentioned, that people must do away with any bad smell that comes from them which can distract, harm and offend other people. The next etiquette that we mentioned before uh, finishing off here is a very important point which I'm going to end on tonight and that is that when we come to the mosque, we must come to the mosque to worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that we come to the mosque for the purpose for which the mosque was built and that is to worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to pray, to read the Qur'an, to study knowledge, to remember Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and we should not come to the mosque in a way that goes against the whole purpose of the mosque to chat about dunya, to buy and to sell to the extent that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam even prohibited that we should uh, announce lost property in the mosque. And there are many narrations in this regard about raising the voice in the mosque, about talking vain and silly speech in the mosque, wasting time in the mosque, buying and selling in the mosque, uh, advertising in the mosque, and um, for business purposes and so on and so forth. These type of behaviors and these type of actions come under the prohibitions 
that are mentioned in the following hadith. So, in the hadith reported by Anas radiallahu ta'ala anhu in Sahih Muslim, part of the hadith, and this is the hadith about the, the Bedouin who came to the mosque and who uh, urinated in the mosque, went into a corner of the mosque and urinated, uh, treating the place as any outside kind of place. And so the Prophet ﷺ directed the companions on how to clean this up. And the Prophet ﷺ explained the purpose of the mosque. So in part of this hadith he said, إِنَّمَا هِيَ لِذِكْرِ اللَّهِ عَزَّ وَجَلْ وَالصَّلَاةِ وَقِرَاءَةِ الْقُرْآنِ the Prophet ﷺ said, these mosques are only for the, the dhikr of Allah, to remember Allah. Azza wa Jal. For as salah to pray, and qira'at al-Qur'an, and to recite and read the Qur'an. And this is the purpose of the mosque, and this is the, the reason why people should be in the mosque. And this is the respect that they should have for people who are also doing those things in the mosque, so as not to disturb them, and not to... Uh, put them off their worship. In the uh, uh, in another narration, in uh, reported by Imam Al Bukhari, in the chapter in which he entitled this chapter "Bab Raf Shouti Fil Masjid," chapter on raising the voice in the mosque. And he mentions a couple of narrations, Imam al-Bukhari mentions a couple of narrations in this chapter. One of them is the following narration, in which As-Sa'ib ibn Yazid says, كنت قائما في المسجد فحصبني رجل فنظرت فإذا عمر بن الخطاب فقال اذهب فأتني بهذين فجئته بهما قال من أنتما أو من أين أنتما قال قال من أهل الطائف قال لو كنتما من أهل البلد لأوجعتكما ترفعان أصواتكما في 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 مسجد رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم. In this hadith, its narration, as Sa'ib ibn Yazid says, I was I was uh, standing in the mosque when someone uh, caught my attention or when someone uh, pulled me. I turned around and I saw that it was Umar ibn al-Khattab. This was during his caliphate when he was the Khalifa. And I, and I saw that it was Umar ibn al-Khattab. He said to me, bring those two men over there to me. So I went and I brought those two people over to Umar. And Umar asked them, Umar asked them, who are you? Or he asked them, where are you from? And they said, we are from the people of Ta'if. We are from the town of Ta'if. So Umar said, if you were people from this place, meaning from al Medina, I would have injured you by beating you. You raise your voices in the mosque of Allah's Messenger, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So in this hadith, in this narration, Umar severely criticized raising the voice in the mosque. And many ulama have mentioned, some ulama have mentioned, that this is because it was the mosque. Not specifically only the mosque of the Prophet ﷺ. Of course that has its lofty status and respect. But it seems as though, as some ulama have mentioned, Shaykh ibn Usaymin and others, that Umar was criticizing raising the voice in the mosque in general. To such a degree, this issue is so important that the ulama have differed. That some ulama said you cannot raise your voice in the mosque at all. Not during a lesson, not because, not in elm, not even when exhorting people and teaching knowledge and speaking about the hereafter and speaking about the deen. And of course not for dunya when speaking or mentioning things about the dunya. Some scholars like Imam Malik rahimahullah ta'ala used to criticize his students for even raising the mosque, uh, raising the voice in the mosque when teaching. And many other scholars allowed raising the voice in the mosque when, it in, when, when, when a person is teaching or giving a khutbah and for the purpose of knowledge. And there are some narrations which indicate that this is allowed. But the point is that the scholars were very careful about raising the voice in the mosque. And that for, per, for the per, when a person is speaking about something which is related to the dunya or some mundane affair, then a person should never raise his, his voice in the mosque 
because of two reasons. The first is that out of respect for the masjid, the masjid is a place that is supposed to be given respect and given its status and a place that has status and respect because it is the place of worship of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala it's not befitting that a person is shouting and raising the voice and arguing or anything like that the second is that there are people who are worshipping Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the masjid who are reading the Quran who are praying we have been forbidden from even reciting above each other in the mosque when we are, and this is a mistake that many people make when they sit and recite Quran in the masjid Sometimes they do it so loudly that they disturb other people who are praying or they, or they confuse other people who are reciting the Qur'an. And this is also something that we shouldn't do and we've been forbidden from doing in the narration. So we should not be putting people, confusing people or putting them off their worship when they are worshipping Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the masjid. So for these two reasons, we should not be raising our voices in the mosque uh, when we are speaking to each other. Except in circumstances where there is a particular Islamic need when there is a khutbah when there is a, a sermon when there is some exhortation when there is some teaching which involves raising the voice slightly in order to get the message across and that, that is an exception that some scholars have made based on other narrations which indicate that this was done and that this is allowed and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows best in another hadith the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said uh, he said, سَيَكُونُ فِي آخِرِ, الـ, uh, في آخر الزمان قَوْمٌ يَجْلِسُونَ فِي الْمَسَاجِدْ حِلَقًا حِلَقًا إِمَامُهُمُ الدُّنْيَا فَلَا تُجَالِسُوهُمْ فَإِنَّهُ لَيْسَ لِلَّهِ فِيهِمْ حَاجًا This hadith has been reported by Al-Tabarani and others and is authenticated by Shaykh Al-Albani in Al-Sahihah In this hadith, the Prophet ﷺ said during the last days, there will be people who will sit in the mosque. They will sit in the mosque in circles. Their imam, meaning their leader and their main topic and the thing that is on their minds, will be the dunya. Do not sit with them. Do not sit with them because Allah has no need of them. Allah has no need of them. So this tells us the status or the position that people who sit in the mosque to speak about dunya matters have. And finally, the hadith of Abu Huraira specific, specifically forbidding a couple of uh, types of conversation or discussion in the mosque. Abu Huraira radiallahu ta'ala anhu reports that Allah's Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, إِذَا رَأَيْتُمْ مَنْ يَبِيعُ أَوْ يَبْتَاعُ فِي الْمَسْجِدِ فَقُولُوا لَا أَرْبَحَ اللَّهُ تِجَارَتَكَ وَإِذَا رَأَيْتُمْ مَنْ يُنْشِدُ فِيهِ ضَالَّهِ فَقُولُوا لَا رَدَّ اللَّهُ عَلَيْكَ And this hadith is in, the, in Sunan At-Tirmidhi and there are many narrations on this topic and that is that the Prophet ﷺ said in the, in the mosque when you see someone buying when you see someone selling or buying then say to that person may Allah not profit may Allah make your transaction, your tijara, your trade not profitable and if you see someone announcing lost property in the mosque, then say to that person, may you never find it, may it never be returned to you. So this is a rebuke from the Prophet ﷺ from buying and selling and doing business in the mosque. And it is a rebuke from making a public announcement in the mosque to, uh, you know, announcing some lost property, something that you've lost. Because this goes against the purpose of the masjid. It goes against the purpose of the masjid. The masjid is not for our personal interests and our personal gains. The masjid is supposed to be full of the ibadah, the worship of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And so based on this, the scholars have also mentioned, I want to mention this as a relevant point. Nowadays we find in some mosques, unfortunately, in some places, you find notice boards and uh, where companies or businesses advertise their services or advertise job opportunities. And the ulama have given a fatwa that is not allowed to advertise jobs or to advertise businesses within the mosque building uh, because this goes against the purpose of the mosque and, it, and, it, and it's something which is analogous and uh, it comes under this issue of doing business, buying and selling uh, in the mosque. So we should be aware of that uh, and... Uh, make sure that none of this enters into the mosque. Those were some of the topics 
or some of the points concerning the etiquette of attending the mosque and being in the mosque, there are many more things that we could say. And as I said, there are many more narrations about each of these topics, but we've only mentioned one or two so that we can cover the ground. And with that, inshallah ta'ala, we finish. Next week, uh, I believe that there is no lesson because of the conference, the winter conference which is going on. So we will resume the forthcoming lesson about Kitab al-Kaba'ir on the Book of Major Sins. Inshallah ta'ala, the week after next. Wallahu ta'ala a'lam wa sallallahu wa sallam ala nabina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in.